Thank you very much for that warm welcome and introduction. Um, as said, my name is Thomas Chester. I'm currently the Ontario Canada PCEA Chairman. Um, I'm a professional engineer in Ontario, Canada. I'm also the founder and CEO of Chester Electronic Design. Um, we're proud to be a sponsor of today's event, and we're also planning on having a chapter meeting coming up sometime this first quarter. Um, our chapter was founded back in October of 2020, and since then we've managed to go and have 25 members go and join us. Um, we are looking uh, for both more members and also people to join our leadership team, um, but also presenters who, if you want to present a topic or you have some information you feel that you want to share, we'd love to hear from you. To help further that, um, we've actually gone and created a Discord chapter. Um, this is open to our chapter, but also to anybody who is interested in joining the Discord, um, where we can use this to communicate and share with each other, but also to uh, share information in designs, um, or if you're having some difficulties within CAD tools. Um, we'd love you to sign up and also spread the word. Um, and it's also my pleasure right now to introduce Jeff Martin, who is the chapter president from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Thanks, Thomas. Um, as you said, I'm Jeff Martin, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul PCA Chairman and Chief Technology Officer at Omni PCB. Uh, the Minneapolis St. Paul chapter is also proud to be a supporter of this awesome event. I hope you all enjoy it. First, I'd like to introduce some fellow board members, some you may know from the industry, some you may not. Uh, Tara Dunn, Tanya Martin, Adam Hook, and Kirk Langscove. Each of these members bring years of experience to the group. So I'm looking forward to working with them to pass that information on to you. Our chapter is roughly two months old or new, however you wanna look at it. We have a chapter meeting planned for the end of February already. And I will be sending out an email and posting on LinkedIn so you can check periodically and sign up. We'd love to have you join us. We'd love to hear your stories, anything you can bring to the table that you think would interest, you know, other designers, manufacturers and such. So quick and simple, I'm the Minnesota guy. You can see below how to get a hold of me. I would love to hear from you. Now, I'd like to introduce the next and new chairman from Greater Michigan, and I hope I get your name right, Dugan Karnazes. Did I get it right? Hey, Jeff, uh, Dugan Karnazes, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, that's one of the better <laughs> attempts I've gotten, so I appreciate that a lot. Um, All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So uh, excited to be the the chairman of the the Michigan chapter, the PCEA. Um, my day job, I'm the founder and CEO of Velocity Research. We're a design firm here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, yeah, I'd also like to introduce our vice chair, Ben Mose, who's in the um, who's a participant here today as well. Um, we have our next meeting. Uh, planned for Q1 of this year. Um, invitations will go out pretty quick here about that as, as we're getting organized. But yeah, like the other like the other chairman said, we're still gathering members. We wanna, we wanna participate with the, the organization as a whole and also help connect designers, engineers, everyone in the industry together, which is really the, the most exciting thing about PCEA uh, for us. So if you'd like to get involved with the Michigan chapter, uh, go ahead, send me an email at my PCEA email down there, or just register at PCEA-org to receive those updates. And yeah, I'll hand it back over to Steph and we'll get, we'll get going with the rest of the presentation. That's awesome. Uh, great, great. So uh, at this point uh, in time, I'd like to introduce our, uh, I'll give you a 
brief introduction of our uh, guest speaker today. And uh, it was Michael Creedon. Uh, he's a near and dear personal friend of mine, as well as one of the, uh, what I would say an industry icon nowadays uh, of what he brings to the industry. Mike's background, he's a technical director of uh, design education for Intellectro. Uh, he's a master trainer uh, for IPC for the CID and CID Plus course as well. He is the vice president of PCA and my right hand uh, in making sure we're getting this up and running and handling business. He is also the uh, standards committee chairman for the uh, IPC 2221 and 2222 standards. He is the founder of San Diego PCB uh, Design LLC. And if anybody knows Mike, or if you don't know Mike, Mike has got a vast experience and background uh, over 44 years. And it's obvious the minute you come to his presence that he loves PCB design. And with that said, I'd like to introduce and hand it off to uh, Mike Creedon. Mike, take it away. Thank you very much, Steph, for a warm welcome. And uh, I take it you can hear me well, Steph? That was my sound yes. check. Yes. <laughs> Welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here today and um, congratulations and thank you very much to um, our sponsor, Ana Varda, um, for sponsoring today's event, an incredible fab shop. I um, encourage you to uh, use them. I know I've built a lot of boards there and I uh, have the highest regard for them. And uh, these chapter chairs, uh, these gentlemen and their collective teams are here to serve in a trade organization that's designed for you. So um, thank you, those speakers. And with that, I'm going to cut into this presentation. And if you feel like asking some questions, you can throw them in there. Uh, um, we have uh, some panel questions at the back end. And if we can do some other ones, um, I will stay on later if you'd like to, um, just to answer questions specific to my presentation. So that being said, um, our topic today, six innovative solutions for hybrid boards. Uh, we've done a lot of hybrid boards over the years, you know, a board with high speed digital and RF on the same board. So we're going to look at uh, some hybrid circuitry with hybrid materials. And um, so there are many hybrid solutions that have been out there and some of them are based on outdated constructs. So I'm going to poke at those. Um, I'm sharing my opinions. I'm not sharing absolute fact in any of this. Um, I'm of the opinion you should always prove all things and hold fast to that, which is good. So uh, that being said, let's keep going. So anybody who's ever sat in one of my slides is gonna see this triangle because when we serve as a printed circuit engineering uh, design layout person, you've gotta address these three perspectives. And if I said DFM, everybody nods their head, they get that. But when I start saying DFS, the solvability, uh, a person who's actually done layout I'll say maybe a 5,000 part board, they know exactly what I'm talking about here. It's a difficult puzzle to solve. And at the same time, you gotta master your CAD tool. The CAD tools we use are sophisticated. And uh, now even with some of the small packaging, you've got HDI concerns. You've really gotta start involving your manufacturer. At the same time, um, if you've ever sat in a Rick Hartley presentation, you know that if you're not addressing signal integrity, integrity concerns, you know, EMI, EMC, um, your circuit could be a throwaway. And that applies to power delivery um, and or thermal considerations. So when we look at all three of these perspectives simultaneously, we're making revision one work. So this is actually the first paragraph of the 2221, of the 2200 series in the IPC specifications as a definition for this perspective or this profession. So thank you. And um, I'm gonna just jump in and just kind of throw one out at you. And uh, again, we'll, we'll talk to the pictures here. So that's what I want you to focus on. But I got to support a couple of uh, 5G constructions recently where you had a digital board and then you had an RF section and then an antenna all on the same board. And so this is a solvability problem because if you look at the very top there, that's a 0.4 millimeter pitch BGA. So 11 mil pads to you uh, imperial base humans, that's tight. You need HDI. And so that created some issues to deal with. And you also, because it was high speed, you needed some high end material. So. I put in a reference for an Isola product here. Um, you know, I do work for Inselectra, so you're gonna see that 
that um, occasionally throughout here because I can speak to their materials. ITER is a good high speed material uh, for some high speed digital when you start getting into the you know, uh, 20 gigabit data transfer type circuitry and fast fries times. And you can see that everything has a good reference to ground so it should perform well. But we then needed to combine what was an RF section in the middle, okay, whereby um, we had some very specific um, thicknesses. And so I used an Astra core, which is a very low um, loss um, type of material, which worked well in that scenario. But looking further into that stack, I've noticed there's no vias going down. That's all field effect antennas and essentially very weird, unique thicknesses. And the construction is almost undoable by a lot of ways of normal conventions. So you'll see in the very center what's known as Ormet paste. So I'm just showing you a very kind of complex uh, board because we deal with boards that are high speed digital RF with antennas or thermal, you know, maybe it's your operational or environment, but uh, I just want to kind of uh, start us off with a, a complex board like that. Now you see the top one in the top right. I told you I'm going to give you six innovations here. So you'll, you'll see that I'm, I'm still in the first one here. And for many years, our industry has built um, HDI, or excuse me, high-speed digital and RF boards um, with antennas. We've been doing that for a while. This is nothing new. Um, and we oftentimes used a lot of the PTFE materials for the RF for the antenna section of the board. And then we bonded it to some sort of an FR4 laminate you know, for the digital circuitry. And um, there was some good rationale to do that. And because the PTFE had significantly better electrical properties like the DK and the DF, okay, then, the, then, then their, their counterpart, the epoxy based materials. And so an example of that would be the PTFE with a 0 0.002 versus what was the DF or the epoxy at 0 0.02. Um, so at 10 gigahertz, that's a significant delta that's gonna hurt you. And so we did this for the longest time. The stack up perhaps looked like that image on the lower right. And so we managed some of the issues of combining these dissimilar materials, but we ignored some of the other issues that could affect electrical properties more. So the point is I'm gonna make with this, it's no longer the fact of some of these reasons why we chose this, okay? And it has some significant flaws. So there's that same image on the right there. And the, the flaw came about is that when you pushed a via through the entire substrate, the dissimilar materials reacted to the CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion, and it created a stress and thus would be a via fracture, which is probably the biggest um, reliability concern. Now, when you test a board when it's cold, your fabricator tests the board and it's cold, it may be fine, but when you put it into a thermal environment, perhaps like the lower right there, you see under hood or, you know, obviously see on the G force is taken off, that kind of stress could cause an intermittent failure, which is a reliability problem that your company doesn't do well having. Or maybe it's, you know, the fabrication and assembly cycles that would follow that could make this thermal excursion worse. Maybe it's operational, like a TX circuitry um, oftentimes gets very hot due to the, uh, you know, the amplification of uh, signals. Maybe you live out there where Steph Chavez lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, he can cook eggs on the hood of the car. So, or maybe it's Alaska. The point being is an environmental condition can make these things worse after the fact. And so when I show the CTE values there, um, you can see that they differ. I mean, copper obviously is going to withstand all, any, all kinds of heat, but the difference be between the PTFE and the epoxies um, is the point. That's the point of it. It's the difference between the two. Not that one is closer to 1,000. That's kind of not the point. The point is the difference between the two stresses the via that traverses both of them. And um, you know, that tensile strength put on that uh, stability is what threatens that via and any kind of shock and vibe can only make it worse. So um, that being said, we're still on number one here that essentially they saw this concern. And so there has been what's known as the PPE and PPO um, material 
materials constructed. And that essentially is some of the um, proprietary resins that go into what have been known to be epoxy based materials. And they've been made now so that they have a similar DF property um, as the PTFEs. Okay. And so what you'll see is in the old comparison in the lower left, you could see how that difference really was significant. The higher you took that, the more loss you'd have. The higher the frequency, the more the loss. Now, when you take a look at something going up into the 100 gigahertz frequencies, they stay right about the same. Okay. And most of us are well into that, you know, 20, 30, 40. I mean, 5G is literally up into the 76 uh, gig right now. So you can see that there's no difference in the materials anymore that would cause the problem. And so what we still want to mitigate loss whenever we can. So I put to you that the biggest way to mitigate loss, and I'm switching to number two here, is there's a couple things. The DF, I just talked about that. They're the same now. Okay, you can see right there 0 0.001 versus 0 0.0017. That's a delta of 0 0.00 seven, so it's insignificant, really. It's, it's very minute. So you can change the conductor width. Well, you probably already did that. But the third thing is the copper profile. So we've heard about copper profile, and we understand that copper has parameters um, to adhere. And they actually, on the PTFEs, a lot of times they have to rough up the copper. And you'll see that on the lower left-hand side. And therefore, the skin effect is dealing with that rougher copper, as opposed to some of what they call the VLP, very low profile copper. So your skin effect is improved. And 80% of all loss, which is equates to about 0.1 or 0.2 dB per inch, um, is going to be is going to occur based on your copper uh, profile. So that's where I'm encouraging you to fight loss is on that front. And, and then use a similar material that won't threaten your vias um, for barrel cracks, stuff like that. So moving along, some of the other materials that um, you can consider, and the idea of mixing laminates is some of the polyimid film cores can be used right into a rigid board. Okay. Um, you typically don't want to use this on an outer layer, but as you can see from that image on the top right, um, it might make a very nice uh, layer between a power and a ground, okay? Because it's a, you can go with a thinner, which helps um, for you know any kind of uh, uh, buried capacitance. It's kind of like a poor man's buried capacitance, if you would, although I will talk about that later. Um, you can see in that image that there's thicker copper between a power and a ground layer, and it has a very low dielectric constant uh, because there's no weave in it. It's just pretty much a, uh, a polyimid base. And uh, so it's very helpful for power and ground delivery. Okay, and you can comes with heavy copper. And one of the other things is it has a very high dielectric um, withstanding. So that's about 5,000 volts um, per mil. Whereas your FR4s are more than that 1,000 volts per mil. So um, it's a very safe to use for um, your power planes. And it's also a very robust for micro crack resistance. And uh, again, the thermal resilience, if you've got some high circuitry, um, it's a nice thermal buffer. So, you know, so and again, you can get these things with many glass reinforcements and, and thermoset prepregs. So there's a handful of different materials that you can use. Um, and some of these hybrid constructions. So we'll take a look at a few more. So again, when you talk about um, polyimid films, um, designers, we do what, I, you know, I always ask the question, what do you do it about? And they say, well, about one in every 10 to 15 boards is a flex. So we tend to not circle around to the question of flex or flex materials that often that we stay proficient at it or stay uh, say apprised of it. And so you always want to work with your fabricator because they're familiar with these materials and what's available to you. And um, you know when you're doing either a flex circuitry or a rigid flex rigid, um, there's a handful of options that are available to you. And especially as you start considering uh, different materials that may have high speed, um, you can use a handful of with the adhesive 
extensive list of materials um, for that. And as far as reliability goes, uh, some of the uh, uh, like some of the the Pyrolex family, they're what's on that uh, the Mars rover that's lasted way beyond everyone's expectations because it's using a very reliable uh, AP uh, Pyrolex AP. So I'm throwing some of those out there just you consider because they have the same properties of dielectric constant and loss and those type of uh, parameters that you should consider, uh, especially if you're doing like a high temp type of scenario. And the other one too is, is it comes with an adhesive or an adhesive less. And so to learn about that, again, talk to your fabricator or a material expert about that. But some of the adhesive um, materials now can actually extend into the rigid board, whereas uh, that was not uh, something that they used often because it had a high flow property. But I'm going to show you an image here. This one is the low loss um, adhesive product. You can see how it drills on the lower right there. And uh, again, it, it's kind of like a pre-preg is to a, an FR4. Um, this essentially is the bonding agent between like copper and coverlay or between a, a adhesive less material and a cover lay. So again, it acts like a joining agent, but some incredible um, low temp um, parameters. And there's some very high temp based polyimids. So there's a lot of options that are available to you as you start dealing with high speed circuitry. Um, I'm showing this here, not again, because I'm just not trying to pitch the product. I actually don't sell. The only one I actually sell to is, is an A on this uh, thing. So I'm, I'm not out to do to sell here. What I'm using this chart to show you is the parameters that we've talked about. These are available. And as you look at some of the materials, they're appropriate for hybrid builds. That's that third uh, column from the left. You can see that it, it's they're compatible materials when you're trying to do um, circuitry that's you know um, high, high data bit or high frequency materials. And you can see that they fall under different IPC slash sheets. And you can also see that some of their um, physical parameters or their electrical parameters, you can make a technically appropriate decision. So, you know, whether it's these materials or, you know, any of the other great materials that are out there, um, make it an informed decision, okay, um, that's technically appropriate. And don't just make the dollar decision, because if you're not building extremely high quantities, the cost should not be the driver. It's the performance and the reliability. Those should be your drivers. Um, so moving along, um, hybrid circuitry, when you start getting, um, for example, BGAs on both sides of the board, like that image on the right, or maybe it's, um, I have RF on one side and, and digital on the other side of a board and I can't send a via all the way through and I start using HDI type of vias, um, something that can be considered and, um, and that's your power distribution. Now I used the expression earlier, um, a little tongue in cheek, but it's actually um, very, technically very appropriate to do is I've used what's called poor man's buried capacitance. That's where I'm considering a polyimid material. Okay, and I actually showed one two slides back, I think, uh, right there on the where the third from the bottom. See that P95 or P25, you know, or, or, or any of the other ones. The point I'm making is that they could be very good between a power and ground distribution pair. It's a pair of planes. You never want to put a voltage plane by itself because it needs to capacitively couple to something else. I use the term capacitively couple. And I'm showing you a cross section of a ceramic capacitor that's been cross section, just like you do a board. And what do you see? It's like a battery. There's plates of metal. And the closer they get, they capacitively couple. And so you need to think about that because the closer I can get my pairs together and you know, epoxy based materials, you really don't wanna go much below two mils um, typically. Um, because either the, you know, the skin effect, or excuse me, the, uh, the tooth of the copper, um, you might actually uh, violate the voltage withstanding. But with some of the poly image, you can get closer, okay? And so I use the center of the board to distribute my power. I, I source it usually on the outside. It comes into a power supply or a connector. And 
And so that's on the outside. Then I take it down to a distribution pair in the center of the board. And then with the appropriate amount of vias, I'll go down to it. And then I'll, with the appropriate amount of vias, go up to the usage. The usage would be there on the top or the bottom in that image on the right. And my caps are on the top side. So basically the planer decouples the pins and my caps actually just um, supply the plane. Now, again, I'm showing you the poor, poor man's buried capacitance, but I'm gonna tell you that there's many materials um, that uh, support this. Um, you know, I know we, we represent the DuPont products. I've actually put one of their names up here. I've used some of the other ones before. I know Panasonic and uh, uh, Okmetsui has a Farad Flex, all great products. Um, you, your job is to do, make a technically appropriate um, evaluation of these different products and select the one that, that you like and that you work with your fabricator in so doing, um, what they're familiar with. Um, I would always obviously lobby for mine, but I'm paid to say that. Um, but I believe that our products are good. And I also, I believe our, the competitors are good too. So I'm not trying to be biased. I'm encouraging you to make the technically appropriate decisions when it comes to that. But just to show you an example of what those might look like, um, uh, Intera has, uh, DuPont has a new product, Intera, the HK04J, and then there's a new one, the 04M. But you can take a look at some of the parameters here. I'm not going to eye chart you guys on this, but uh, I want you to have the general visualization on the right hand side of some very thin dielectrics. Okay. And again, the thin dielectric. Um, equates to increasing the capacitance. But I will, I'm gonna back up a slide for a second and I'm gonna to put to you that at some point you're solving the capacitance problem. You literally, when you get over a certain frequency, you probably have more than enough capacitance. What you lack is good low inductance, okay? Capacitance needs to be high, inductance needs to be low. So that is derived from both the material itself and then how you apply the material, how you do the design. That's why the power and ground planes, or should I say ground and power, as in that image shows, is close to the surface because I want a low inductance delivery. It's kind of like if I have this capacitor and I put it on the other side of the room, it's serving me no value. It has low value out there, it has no value because of the inductance to deliver the capacitance. And so it's not just an issue of capacitance, that's my point. Um, when circuits hit a certain high speed frequency, worry more about the inductance delivery, that's my point. Okay, um, I wanna get into this um, next slide here and doing my best to uh, try to finish in a timely manner that the concept of a, uh, uh, TLPS, a transient liquid phase sintering. Now, this is going to become more and more prevalent in our industry. Um, I've been designing boards with this since 2008. Uh, it's used in package designs, um, which is, you know, the BGA package where they chip on board and it goes down to a BGA pattern. Um, it's used in cell phones and some of the very thin, high dense boards like that. And it's been around for a long time. And, but it's, Acceptance is low. And most vias are derived however you drill them, drilling mechanically or laser, and then you're gonna plate them. Now that requires the access um, typically, and um, it creates for a methodology of how to apply the plating. And it's a temperature um, excursion you apply to your board, and we'll take a look at that. And the plating is, um, problematic because it threatens your board with that heat cycle. This essentially is putting in a paste, which um, essentially is a, uh, an alloy between uh, a copper and, and a tin with a business um, binder. You can kind of see in that second image to the right, it, it's heated at a very low temperature, but once it heats, it cures and it will not re um, liquid on you and it has a very high melting temperature, uh, well beyond anything you'd ever experience. And you can see just kind of the, uh, the particles as they coalesce and join together in the lower right animation. But uh, there's a couple of aspects of how to apply this and that's what I'm gonna show on the next slides. So here we can take a high layer count board 
board, let's say we have a 32 layer board and try to drill that with a normal via, you know, say maybe a 12 mil, 13 mil via, that's an aspect ratio that's very difficult to build. And people have learned how to do it, but it's problematic to plate and it also destroys routing resources. What you can and do as an alternative, you could make four sublaminations and selectively put in the sintered paste on a prepreg, as you see there on the right. And you could join these together. So it'd be a two lamination um, construction. And at any point, I can remove the vias on any of those inner or below um, sublams. And so I'm solving the high aspect ratio drilling problem or back drilling, that type of scenario. The other one, which is really starting to get take hold is we are all building HDI type boards. If I say a 4N4 or a 5N5, a 4N4 goes through five lamination cycles. You can see it on the top there where I, I have the core and then I add two layers and I do the process steps, which is about 30 to 50, depending who you talk to, they'll all tell you how many process steps. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And collectively, you. You could go through some four or five lamination cycles to get that. Or you could use the one on the right and just put the paste on every layer and one lamination. Or in the lower right, you can do it as a two-step thing where essentially um, instead of, you know, four or five laminations, you could turn it into two lamination cycles. So where does that help the fabricator? It cuts his cost on the, on the floor almost in half because a five lamination board can take upwards of 20 days for them to complete. Whereas a two lamination cycle board could be done sometimes in a week or less or two weeks, pick, pick a number though. So there's great significant cost savings and the reliability um, is fine. I mean, here's an example of how this is, happens. They basically have your, your cores and then they're gonna kind of do a quick tack of the uh, prepreg and the dark green in the middle. They're going to squeegee the paste in. That's all done automated process. Um, no extra equipment to do this. It's easy for your fabricator to do appropriate. And then one lamination puts them all together. And it'll look like that V on the top right there. It's copper connecting copper. So that is the HDI paste. Um, testability results. I always get asked this. Um, you need to prove it with your own reliability data. I can show you a slide where you know, we did this and whether it's 500 cycles or a thousand cycles and they all fell within that 5% um, um, range. And so, and then a lot of the different materials that you can see the high speed materials as I've listed on the left, they all support this and they work very well with it. So um, the last thing I wanna cover for innovations is the concept of, I've told you about the sintering paste for vias on the right there. Um, this also works with some of like Omega Ply or Tyser technologies like buried resistors um, and kind of the planar um, capacitors, like I said, the DuPont materials or uh, the Okmatsui's or Panasonic's, all those would work with this paste. And it's really good for RF devices or antennas. Um, so, but on the left, the sintering paste is also used for devices too, where you cut out a cavity and you put um, a little bit of paste and the paste would um, harden during board lamination. So you don't have to solder it and then laminate the board. The paste actually hardens during lamination of the bare board. So you backfill the cavity with a resin and you're good to go. So that's essentially what we've been covering here. So some PTFE alternatives, some advanced copper foils, some polyamide based dielectrics uh, used either on a flex or rigid flex or just even on a rigid some embedded capacitance, um, whether that's using the, uh, the materials, which are not that big of a cost adder, um, but they're very, um, they perform well. Some advanced paste and some embedded components. Um, I'm trying to give you some technically appropriate ideas to think about, and hopefully you find and improve your own uh, innovation with all this. So that being said, I'm gonna say thank you for my time to present today. And at this point in time, I'd like to, our speakers and um, uh, the panelists to hop on. My technical information is here and the vi Vimeo of this presentation um, can be available to you. And the few of the questions I will 
we'll try to answer after our panel discussion. So with that, Steph, over to you, sir. Uh, 